So what impacts at least one person in the U.S. every 20 minutes and affects one in four families here in Baltimore County? Sadly, that issue is domestic violence. Greetings. I'm John Lazarou and host of To Your Health here on GBMC's Facebook Live show. Joining us today is Laura Clary, forensic nurse examiner, correct? Yes. And also clinical program manager of the GBMC SAFE program. And what we're going to do today is talk about not just about domestic violence, although I'm sure you know that October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but we're also going to talk about teen dating violence and sexual assault. Laura, thank you very much for joining us today. We have a lot of things to get to. And the, the biggest point that I want to address today is how sexual assault, domestic violence, teen dating violence, not only affects the individual, but our community as a whole. So we have a lot of questions uh, coming your way today. So I'm really glad you're here and, and really looking forward to talking to you about these sensitive issues. So we, we addressed about domestic violence and we talked about how October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So in our discussion before the show today, we talked about that, yes, it's, it's known as domestic violence, but it's also known as partner, uh, intimate partner uh, violence, correct? That's correct, yeah. So let's talk about what is domestic violence, or in this case, what is intimate partner violence, and kind of also give us what are the types and explain a little bit on each of those. Sure. So uh, we like to use the term intimate partner violence because it encompasses all the different types of couples that it can affect. Basically what it is, it is a repeated abusive behaviors that one partner uses against another partner in order to maintain or gain control over that individual. Um, this type of act is all about having power and control over um, another person. It can be in the form of any kind of physical abuse sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and even financial abuse. And now what we're seeing more with our younger generation, especially the teen dating violence, is actually digital abuse where they're using technology to actually abuse and control their partner. And we're going to talk about teen dating violence uh, later on in, in our show. So what are some of the causes or risk factors associated with domestic or intimate partner uh, violence. I think those are important. And also, what are some of the early signs or signs that, for example, you know, someone can see their, in their friend or in their loved one that something's just not right? So one thing we say about this is that this is a crime that does not discriminate based on race, on gender, on socioeconomic status. It can affect communities everywhere around us. It happens all around us. We just have to kind of open our eyes so that we can see it. So things that we look for um, in people that may be victims of domestic violence or intimate partner violence is if you notice that they're starting to withdraw, if things that used to interest them, they're not really having an interest in it anymore. Um, obviously, if you see physical signs of abuse like bruising um, where the story really just doesn't add up um, about how they got that injury. Um, if you notice that somebody's really being controlled by their partner, if their partner seems that they're overbearing and constantly checking in on them or checking in on their phone records and things like that, those are all red flags that that person may be a victim. Um, we see this a lot too in situations where there is a financial strain, if there's already marital problems. Um, sometimes we do see it in patients that have um, a history of mental illness because they can be more vulnerable to falling victim to something like that. This. And, you know, I, I want to also talk about, and we're going to get, like I said, to a lot of things. And also, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in our comment section at the bottom of the page. Or if you would like, please send them in through a private message on Facebook. We're really hoping we get to hear from you guys. Um, Laura, let me, you mentioned again teen dating violence, and we'll get to that, I, I, I promise, and also sexual assault. But um, what I want to talk a little bit more about the effects of domestic abuse. Um, what are some of the effects, like if I would say to you the top three to five effects of domestic abuse, what would those be? 
so domestic abuse uh, not only affects the individual, um, but it also affects the family and everyone who witnesses it as well. As far as the individual, we see people that come in through the hospital emergency department a lot, um, mainly because a victim is more likely to go to their doctor or to come into the hospital before they actually go to the police about something like this happening. Sometimes they come in with really vague symptoms like a headache or fatigue or what we see a lot is gastrointestinal problems, upset stomach, nausea, things like that and they may not realize that all of those illnesses are a result of the abuse that, that's happening in the home. Um, additionally, what we see with children who grow up in situations where they're witnessing abuse on a regular basis, they begin to think that that's a normal part of a relationship. So actually by them witnessing this, um, we could be potentially creating the next generation of abusers as well as victims because they think that that's what love looks like when it's not. Um, and then as a community as a whole, I think it's important for everyone again to realize that this does happen right around us and it can affect people people in their work life. Um, it can affect all aspects of their life. Real quick, one quick question. I, I know it's October and you know, before you know it, the holiday seasons are, are coming around. Mm -hmm. um, do these incidences of domestic violence happen to spike around the holidays? Uh, and, and if so, why? So they do tend to spike around holidays and other big events such as the birth of a baby, um, mainly because stress is already increased around the holidays, um, especially around Christmas time where people are spending more money or they may not have the money to buy things that they need. So any kind of increased stress in a household makes it more likely to kind of peak that domestic violence situation. Okay. So Laura, as you know, you and I have We've talked a lot over over the years, uh, just through our interaction within GBMC, and you know that I have two kids, and you have two kids of your own. I have a son and a daughter, and to me, um, domestic violence, sexual assault, and teen dating violence is really on my radar screen. Um, and I think for parents, it's not just a subject matter they should talk about with their daughters, they should also talk about it with their sons. So mm -hmm. with that said, let's talk a little bit about teen dating violence. What is teen teenage dating abuse, and, and who's doing it? Like, can you give us like where it's prevalent, what age groups it's prevalent in, and, and why? So typically when we see teen dating violence, it encompasses all of the same things of domestic and intimate partner violence, except it's a much younger generation. So we're typically seeing it kind of starting between 12 years old and going all the way to 18 years old. It can again have that same components as someone being overly controlling over their partner, um, checking in on their social media. And now with having social media, it's making it so much easier to actually stalk someone just by following their Facebook pages, their Twitter accounts, as well as what we're seeing more and more is actually using social media to their advantage by saying, I mean, I have embarrassing photos of you, I have information about you, and I'm going to post this so that all of your friends can see it. Um, and that's a form of digital abuse that we're seeing in teen dating violence. Um, I feel like it's becoming more prevalent, too, because, you know, Teens are relatively inexperienced when it comes to dating. Um, they're at a time in their life where they're seeking approval from their peers and they're trying to gain a little bit of independence from their parents. Sure. So it, it may be happening to them and they just don't know what to do about it. They don't know who to talk to. They may be embarrassed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you know, it's important to kind of recognize as a parent some potential warning signs that you may see in your child um, when something like this is going on. I, I want to come back to um, kind of the, the hidden aspect mm -hmm. of this. You said embarrassment mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why they don't want to talk about it. What could be some of the other reasons why teenage abuse might be hidden? Not just hidden from parents, but from friends, um, uh, family members. Why? So it could be hidden too because maybe they feel threatened by their partner. Maybe their partner has again threatened to do things against them or to do things against their family. Sometimes they might not understand that what's happening to them is abuse. That may be the big thing. They're not understanding that this isn't normal. This is not normal. This is not what love looks like. So again, it's important for you know us as adults to recognize the signs and symptoms and to be able to you know intervene when necessary.
Joining us today on, on To Your Health here on Facebook Live is Laura Clary, forensic uh, nurse examiner and clinical program manager of the GBMC SAFE program. And we're going to talk a little bit about the SAFE program and what those acronyms all mean and, and stuff. But um, I want to encourage you all, please submit your questions in our comment section uh, on our Facebook page. And like I said, if uh, you privacy is an issue, please feel free to send us a private message as well with any questions you might have for Laura Clary, clinical program manager and forensic nurse at our GBMC SAFE program. Um, Laura, let me, uh, you know, you talked about digital abuse, sexual abuse. There's also emotional, verbal, and physical, right? So um, what are some of the warning signs, you know, that a teen is involved in, in an abusive relationship and that a, um, or that a girlfriend or boyfriend, mm -hmm. boyfriend or partner, right. for that matter, is being abusive in, in a teen dating relationship? So a couple of the warning signs that we see in teens is if you have a child that does really well in school and they enjoy going to school and you start to notice that they're no longer enjoying going to school, they're missing a lot of classes, they're late to classes, their grades start to fall, or perhaps they're an athlete or they're in the band, something that they really enjoy doing that they start losing interest in. That's a huge red flag, as well as other risk-taking behaviors. If you notice that your child has started using drugs or is drinking, um, use that and engage in a conversation and find out if something is happening. Um, other things that we look for is when they start to withdraw from their own family or if you notice it or witness it that their partner is trying to pull them away from the family, that's a huge red flag. If you notice that their partner is constantly looking in their phone and right. invading their privacy, that's when as a parent you need to intervene and ask some questions. Yeah, there's many good points there, uh, Laura, that I think parents should pay attention to for, um, you know, that had with, with their kids. Uh, we did have a question that did come in before our program. It said, if someone is abusing you, and they're talking about a teenage uh, dating mm -hmm. uh, situation, if someone is abusing you, what can you do and how do you go about doing it? Can you give a little um, information on that? Sure. So there are a lot of resources out there within the community. There are a bunch of different resources, specifically in Baltimore County, um, in each jurisdiction. So if you're in school and you can go to your guidance counselor and you can confide in your guidance counselor that something may be happening and they can help point you in the right direction. I think it's really important for people to know again that you are not alone, mm -hmm. that this happens a lot within our community and that there are resources out there um, for people to reach out to and to give you um, you know advice about what to do in your situation and each situation is unique right uh, one other question that um, came in is uh, how can how can you make the right choices while dating to protect yourself from being either the source or the victim of dating violence I think the first thing to do is to recognize the signs mm -hmm. um, early recognizing the signs that, okay, this person it seems to be really overly controlling. Um, I think, you know, again, the sooner that we catch it, the sooner you can try and get away from that situation. So knowing the warning signs of when, you know, it is not appropriate for someone to invade my privacy. It is not appropriate for somebody to call me names or to put their hands on me. That is not appropriate. And to know that those signs, um, those early warning signs so that you can get out of the situation right. early. Awesome. Again, we're joined today by Laura Clary, a forensic nurse examiner, registered nurse as well, um, with our GBMC SAFE program. I want to talk a little bit about the SAFE program. Um, what does the acronym SAFE mean? And also, for our viewers out there today and just the public in general, if they want to support the GBMC SAFE program, how can they go about doing that? So SAFE stands for Sexual Assault Forensic Examination. And basically what we do is we are a group of forensic nurses and victim advocates that care for patients that come into the hospital that have been victims of sexual assault, um, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, and child abuse. And we work very closely with our community partners. Um, Turnaround is one of them in the community. It's a rape crisis center, as well as the Baltimore County Police Department. And basically what we do is we want to make sure that that patient comes in and receives the best care possible from mm -hmm. the time they walk through those doors until the time that we discharge them. 
Um, we're always looking for support because our patients are always needing things from us. Sometimes we have to take their clothing um, as a part of evidence. So we want to be able to send them home in clothes. We want to be able to give patients that aren't able to return home um, a bag filled with toiletries. Sure. So if anyone's interested in donating um, clothes that they need to get rid of, underwear, toiletries, toothbrushes, things like that we're always looking for. Um, we always try to make what we call getaway bags for patients that don't have a safe home to return to. And inside those bags, we can put track phones and soap and spare clothes and things like that. So even if we have to put them in a hotel for the night, they'll have things that, that they need with them. Now, Laura, I, you know, I think that the important part is that when someone is brought in at GBMC who's a victim of sexual assault, domestic violence, or teen dating violence, mm -hmm. They don't have to go into the ED. They can go straight into the SAFE program. So my question to you is, I know we have one at GBMC, but I think it's also good for people out there to know that there are other SAFE programs in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Can you just give us, a, here in the immediate area, besides GBMC, who might have a SAFE program? So Mercy Medical Center has a SAFE program as well, and they typically see all of the patients from the Baltimore City area. Um, Frederick Memorial has a SAFE program. Harford County um, has a SAFE program um, out of Upper Chesapeake. And Carroll Hospital Center in Carroll County. Those are the ones that are right in our immediate area. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to know that even if your crime did not occur in Baltimore County, if what happened to you ha happened outside of the Baltimore County area and you end up at GBMC, we will still provide that service even though it was outside of the jurisdiction. Okay. Now we talked about how you're a forensic nurse examiner. You're also a what we call a SANE, a sexual mm -hmm. assault nurse examiner, correct? Yes. Um, can you just elaborate what kind of training? Now, there's, there's a there's and I know this because of our discussions there's a big difference between a nurse in that do what they do and a nurse that does what you do can you just talk about not just the differences but also the training that that is in involved in becoming a forensic nurse examiner or a sexual assault nurse examiner sure so everyone within our program is first and foremost a registered nurse we all come from different backgrounds that could include med surge emergency uh, ICU so all of the nurses have a wide variety of nursing experience and um, in addition to that to being a registered nurse they also sit for a Maryland Board of Nursing approved course it's 40 hours and once they sit through that course, then they do clinical requirements as well. So once they complete their coursework, their classroom training, as well as their clinical training, and they work under an experienced precepting forensic nurse, then they can apply for their certification. Hmm. So it's, it's a lot of extra work to, in order to get that certification. Sure. And then to even go a step further to obtain your SANE certification is more training and actually an exam that you need to sit for. Um, again, we are joined by Laura Clary, uh, Clinical Program Manager and Forensic Nurse Examiner with the GBMC SAFE program. Uh, Laura, that's a lot of great information and we're going to also uh, inform our viewers again on how they can help the SAFE program um, over at GBMC. But right now, you know, we, we, since we talked about uh, sexual assault nurse examiner, let's mm -hmm. talk about sexual assault. Um, for sexual assault, what happens when, when you're a patient of sexual assault? How are you, uh, what happens when you're treating? a patient of sexual assault? So all of our patients typically come in through the emergency department. Um, they are considered a priority and once they walk through the door, the triage nurse will make sure that they're medically okay, get their vital signs, get a little bit of information about what happened and then they will initiate the safe team. They will call the nurse to come in and specifically care for that patient. Um, we find out a little bit about what happened. We make sure again that they're medically stable and then we actually take them to a private area that's separate from the GBMC emergency department. Mm -hmm and we um, perform what's called a sexual assault forensic examination. Um, basically, it's a medical forensic examination where we document injuries as well as collect potential evidence from a crime. What's important to know is that when we are treating these patients, we want to give them control back because the crime that happened to them was all about taking that control away. Mm -hmm. And we want to give a little bit of that control back, even if that only involves their health care. So we allow them to make their own decisions regarding what we do during the exam, what we don't do during the exam, and whatever direction they want to go in as far as their health care options. Um, 
maybe a few weeks ago or you know a couple years ago we had the uh, our former vice president uh, Joe Biden come visit us here in the state of Maryland and also um, there was some discussions down in Annapolis about uh, rape kits mm -hmm. and the longevity of the rape kits when it you know keeping them on on the shelf but I think what the important part is and something that I think you can shed some light on is you know what it it's easy to say what is a rape kit we have an idea mm -hmm. but what are the contents and how is what you collect as a sexual assault nurse examiner uh, how is that used in the overall treatment of a sexual assault victim so the kit is actually um, a bunch of different envelopes with swabs and again based off of what the patient tells me about what happened to him or her kind of guides my exam on where I'm going to look for any kind of potential evidence. Again um, asking permission prior to doing any part of the exam is super important and those swabs that we collect we then dry and package and then seal everything up and then it gets stored at the crime lab and hopefully something that we collect in that kit will help to link a perpetrator um, or a suspect to that crime that happened to our patient. And something that um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on and something that I learned early on when I when I came to GBMC is you guys are collecting evidence. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't just leave it somewhere. Uh, you, that evidence that you collect has to stay with you. How long does it stay with you as a sexual assault nurse examiner? And how do you keep those contents close? So we have to follow what's called chain of custody and it's very, very strict. So from the time that I meet with my patient to the time that I package up all of my evidence, I have to be able to account for each piece of evidence. And basically what we do is once we complete the kit, we seal it, we sign it with our official signature and our title and the time and the date, and then we put it in an evidence locker. Mm -hmm. And we fill out a chain of custody form and it stays in that locked evidence locker until the Baltimore County Crime Lab can come and collect it. Typically, they come and collect our evidence within one hour of us calling. They're pretty fast. And then they, at that point, fill out the chain of custody form that shows that we've handed that piece of evidence over to them, and then they maintain it at the crime lab for up to 20 years. Okay, awesome. Um, let's go back to domestic violence, okay? Um, we talked about how it's assessed, uh, how intimate partner violence is, is treated, but, um, how is it, and from, from your perspective and from, from the work that you do, I'm gonna bring in the other aspect, how is intimate partner uh, abuse legally addressed? How, how do you, how, how is that addressed legally? So from my perspective, from the healthcare perspective, uh, domestic violence and intimate partner violence are not mandated reports. Meaning that when a patient comes in and they disclose that they're a victim of domestic violence, I cannot legally contact police until the patient gives me permission to. And we do ask them, you know, would you like us to contact police for you? But again, we want to give them the control to make that decision. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that that patient is ready for that option. Um, the other thing that we have to do is make sure they understand all of their different options. So maybe they're not interested in contacting police at this point, but maybe they are interested in getting a protective order. And we have, again, 24-7 domestic violence advocates that can come in and work with these patients and go over, um, you know, crisis counseling and safety planning and helping to link them with other resources in the community that can give them more information on all the legal options that they have. Uh, Laura Clary, Clinical Program Manager, Forensic Nurse Examiner with the GBMC SAFE Program. For our viewers out there, if you're interested, please send us in a question in our comment section below, or you can even private message on our Facebook page if privacy is an issue for you. Um, Laura. Something that always strikes me that, that's odd is that um, why is the victim of sexual assault immediately the one that is blamed for the incident and that the burden of proof per se uh, continues to be what I think is misplaced? Can you elaborate a little on that? I think it's because uh, we still live in a society where rape culture is very real and I think people still go to that immediate thought of, well, why was she drinking so much? And we even see this when it comes to child abuse, where mm -hmm. they'll say, well, kids, they make up stories, they have an imagination. So I think the first thing we need to do is to stop immediately placing blame on the victim. It doesn't matter what that person did. All of the events that led up to that assault, none of that matters. Nobody deserves to be sexually assaulted or abused regardless of you know, any kind of poor decision that they may have made. Mm -hmm. No one deserves that. Right. Agreed. Um, 
how can what changes can we make in our society? Do you think? And because and I ask you this because you see so much. You know, what I mean, given your position and and what you do for a living, um, how can our society basically change this misunderstanding of how violence operates and this idea that we have that victims of domestic violence violence, excuse me, incite the abuse or they, they bring it upon themselves? Mm -hmm. What changes can we make? I think it goes back to the same thing with sexual assault, where we need to stop immediately placing blame on the victim for the situation that they are in. Um, we hear it a lot where people will say, well, why doesn't, why don't they just leave the situation? Well, it's not that easy. You know, sometimes they can't just leave the situation because maybe they're financially dependent on their partner. Maybe they don't have anywhere to go. Maybe they've been isolated so much from their friends and family that if they leave, they really don't have anywhere to go. So their only option is to either be homeless or to stay in that situation. And then it gets even more complicated when there's children involved. True. Yeah, um, we have about five minutes left on our program today. So please, for those of you out there, if you have any questions or comments, please submit them at the bottom of our Facebook page, or you can private message us. We're joined today by GBMC's uh, forensic nurse examiner, clinical program manager for the SAFE program, Laura Clary, who, by the way, I don't know if many of you know this or not, was uh, nominated and won as America's most amazing nurse. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Now you have a trip coming up soon, right? Yes. Uh, as a result of, of your winnings. Congratulations. Thank and we're, as like I said to you back then, I say to you now, we're all very proud of you. Um, you know, we're going to be wrapping it up soon, so just a couple more uh, questions. But before that, let me ask: you, What brought you to become a forensic nurse examiner? Why did you pick this 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 road of, of work? Well, I've I always knew that I wanted to work in healthcare, but I also always loved forensics. Mm -hmm. So when I got into nursing, um, I started working in the emergency department, which, by the way, I absolutely love. I loved working in the ER, and um, I worked in an inner city hospital. And we would see patients that would come in that we would triage that were victims of sexual assault. And I kind of wondered, well, we couldn't provide the service at that hospital, so what happened to these patients? So I started looking into um, you know, forensic nursing and learned about GBMC's program and took the course here and have been with the program since 2010. So as we wrap up towards the end, two, two, two questions. One, what's the take home message? When, when I say to you domestic violence, sexual assault, teen dating violence, what's the take home message? I think the take home message is to not ignore that it happens right within our community. Um, realize that it does happen and it does not discriminate against any particular person. It happens from all different walks of life. Um, recognizing the early signs that something might be happening and then not being afraid to say something. Mm -hmm. You know, not being afraid to ask your friend, is everything okay? And I'm here if you need somebody to talk to. Sometimes that's all it takes is just somebody, somebody to stand up and, and ask if you're okay. If you're a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, or if you're a teenager, where can you go get help? We talked about this, but I really want to st stress it again as we're getting towards the end of our program. Where can we, where can they get help? So GBMC has a program where we see, again, sexual assault as well as domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Northwest has a program. It's called the Dove Program, where they see uh, domestic violence patients as well. Um, Turnaround, located in Towson, has a program where they can assist. And then if you're a teenager and you're in school, you can go to your guidance counselor and they can help to link you to resources in the community. There's also hotlines and um, web pages that you can go to. And if you don't want to face-to-face -face talk with somebody, you can actually talk via um, like a chat room. Okay. And so that's, you know, it's, it's really important to know that you're not alone and that there is a lot of resources out there. And for anyone that's interested, you can contact the SAFE program and we can help to link you to the appropriate resources within our community. That's all the time we have for today. If you have any additional comments or questions, please feel free to send them along. We'll chat with Laura and, and get you a, a response to those questions or comments as, so, as soon as possible. Uh, Laura, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, you brought a lot of great information, and I hope that those that watched us today um, uh, have taken note and listened to what you say, because I th really think education is really the big part mm -hmm. in helping us stop these unfortunate incidences that happen, the incidents of sexual assault, domestic violence, 
teen dating violence. Um, and I really do appreciate you joining us today and, and, and giving us some sound advice. Thank you. Uh, please join me next month here on To Your Health as we talk about um, diabetes and holiday eating. We're going to have a new time to our program. We're going to start our program on Wednesday, November 8th at 1230. We're also going to have a little special surprise, but I'm not. Okay. I might tell you at the end <laughs> what it is, but I'm not going to tell okay. our viewers today. Anyway, thank you again for joining us. Laura, appreciate you coming out. Cheers and to your health.